Hey everyone, welcome to today's live demo on building scalable ML ops with Snowflake and Data Robot. Uh, and to get the demo started as soon as possible, I'm just going to go ahead and get it started. Uh, as a first step, let me introduce myself and today's demo leaders. My name is Julian Ferrer, and I'm a product marketing manager for the data science workload. And for today's demo experts, we're going to have uh, Tony, who is a director of data science at Data Robot, and Miles, who is a partner sales engineer here at Snowflake for our AI and ML partners. And uh, as we go through the demo, you'll get to meet them uh, a little bit more. At a very high level, we're going to cover four things. First, we're going to show you how easy it is to leverage third-party data in order to increase the performance of your model's predictability. Uh, then we're going to prepare the data using a simple notebook and do all the feature engineering using Snowpark. Snowpark is a way that lets you code in your preferred language of choice and lets you execute that code directly in Snowflake. Today, we're going to use Scala, but in the future, you're going to be able to use more languages to process data directly in Snowflake. We'll then train and evaluate a fraud prevention model using Data Robot. And finally, we'll export that train model and run inference directly in Snowflake using the new Java UDF functionality. Of course, ask questions along the way, and we'll try to answer as many as we can after we end the demo. But before we dive into the demo, I'd like to quickly speak to the importance of incorporating data science and AI into your world. It's of course no secret that AI is transforming the world, and an estimate that we've seen is that AI will boost the global economy by over 15 trillion over the next uh, years or nine years or so. But capturing that value requires for you to get started. And according to McKenzie, uh, the advantages that those early AI adopters will gain uh, is going to take time over the competition and is going to create a gap that will widen to a point where the gap laggards uh, are not going to catch up, creating a real business threat. And so whether you're hearing it or not, there's already those early adopters that are creating this AI gap in your industry. And as such, AI is not just a competitive advantage anymore, but it's really a business need in every organization. Of course, things that have benefits sometimes have their own challenges. And one of the things that we always hear with data science and machine learning is that 80% of the data of the process is data prepping. And the reality is that that's not too far off. So from a study of over 1,000 data scientists uh, in an Aconda State of Data Science report, we can see that data scientists spend on average two thirds of their time uh, cleaning, preparing and visualizing data. So doing everything that's related to the data improvement steps. And so why does this happen? Well, one, data silos make data uh, collection time consuming. This means that data scientists have to go through the process of first finding data across different uh, systems and data marts and then get access to that. Not only they have to go through those, but they may have to go to data lakes if they're trying to use other data than it's not structured, such as semi-structured and unstructured data. Last, I think many data scientists spend time looking for data that maybe doesn't exist within the organization and trying to get that incorporated, whether it's from a partner or supplier or whether it's third-party data that they want to use. Uh, it's a very cumbersome process. And so that could happen or just take a very long time. The second thing is the compute bottlenecks that slow down the data preparation and understanding. As we all know, the success of a model is all in the feature engineering. How we represent the data to the model and help the model understand what patterns to identify is really what drives success into the performance of the model. And so it sort of makes a lot of sense that data scientists will spend a lot of time doing all the feature engineering. But what doesn't make sense is to spend longer than needed to work in environments with concurrency limitations or systems that have to be manually scaled uh, to meet the demands, the ever-changing demands between training and deployments. And so the challenges of the processing can not only create bottlenecks during the experimentation, but also when you try to run more data and running inference at scale. And we know that running from prototype to production is also a challenge. And while this is an ideal stage where every organization wants to be in order to really get value from those models, we know from a Forrester study that most models never get to that point. As 62% of organizations interviewed for the study uh, mentioned they failed to deploy any models into production. And in fact, they identified things like low collaboration between the development and operation teams, lack of cohesive technology, and then also lack of AI skills. And so in order to remain competitive and get to production, organizations need to close both 
the skills, technology, and operations gaps in order to truly run machine learning in a repeatable, secure, and cost-effective manner. Snowflake and Data Robot are great at this. They provide users of any skill with the ability to build and deploy powerful ML capabilities on more data before than ever. Through the integration, Data Robot users can access all the data that's being available in Snowflake, whether it's structured or semi-structured data that's been um, prepared, as well as the new capabilities to, uh, to use on structured data. And of course, the, use, the ease of use to use third-party data through our data uh, marketplace. The second thing is being able to accelerate that feature engineering. Data robots feature discovery uh, capabilities are great. And the other great thing about it is that it can push many of the functionality or many of the processing that's done for that feature engineering back into Snowflake to leverage that scalable compute engine. And last, once the model has been trained using data robots AutoML, then you can truly make it easy to operationalize that model. Operationalizing means running it at scale and being able to take those results back into Snowflake so that both users and applications can leverage those AI insights. And so that was a very quick overview of our joint solution. And now I'm gonna to let Tony tell you more about our integrations and other use cases that your organization can build with Snowflake and Data Robot. Yeah, thanks, Julian. Yeah, so as mentioned, Snowflake and Data Robot are seamlessly integrated in order to, pro to provide the most efficient workflow while giving users the flexibility to use different components of the Data Robot family of products. So with pre-built-in integrations into the Snowflake data platform, users can now visualize and transform the data with a tool that they're most comfortable with, whether it's code with notebooks and Snowpark or leveraging Data Robot's automated feature discovery. They now have that choice to pick which they want. So once a model is built and deployed with Data Robot's AutoML platform, Models can now be moved to Snowflake for in-database scoring while still being able to monitor the model for data drift with Data Robot's ML Ops. So in today's demo, we'll go through the approach of using Zeppel and Snowpark to demonstrate the ability to push down processing for feature engineering. Then we're going to train the model in Data Robot. And finally, we're going to deploy the model in Snowflake for in-place scoring. So with that, I'd like to get into how you can start unlocking the potential of your data science in your organization. There are many tried and tested use cases across numerous industries. You can see some of the popular use cases listed here. And if you visit pathfinder.datarobot.com, you can get more granular by exploring the use case by industry as well as department. I highly recommend this resource as it not only provides over 100 specific use cases, but it also has end-to-end -end guides that provide a framework along with best practices on how you can implement AI in your own organization. So you'll see here Data Robot has helped multiple organizations across different industries and geographies adopt AI with massive impact. To scratch beyond the surface, for just one of these success stories, I'd like to touch on Harmony. This is an online peer-to-peer -peer lending service that connects investors with borrowers. For them, getting the best performance out of a risk model is essential to business. A 1% improvement in the area under, under the curve of a model is equal to about $1 million a year. And this just shows the impact that this stack can have. Another joint customer of Snowflake and Data Robot is Beacon Street Services. While they're not on this slide, I do want to call them out as they're seeing an additional roughly $15 million in sales thanks to this stack. Once they brought Data Robot in-house, Beacon was able to develop and deploy data science models six times faster. This resulted in a 10% lift in their marketing campaigns and ultimately the additional sales. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Miles. Okay, thank you for that, Tony. So we are now going to transition over to the demo portion of the session. The use case we're going to look at today is one of fraud detection, where we have a bunch of transaction data to work with. We're going to perform supervised machine learning in data robot uh, and train a model on a bunch of historic, historical examples of fraud that we were, we were able to catch. 
and then build a model so we can make future predictions. To give you a quick look at the data set here, our main target variable will be is fraud. This will be a binary classification problem that we're going to try to solve. Zero, this was not fraudulent, or one, this was, was fraudulent. And we can see here, we have a bunch of different other types of data. For example, categoricals, Boolean, numeric. We have some missing values as well. And we also have some freeform text. The, the beauty of data robot is we'll be able to handle kind of all of this uh, automatically out of the box for you. So you can get the value as quickly as possible. Now, I also want to introduce Zeppel, which was uh, just recently acquired by data robot. Zeppel is a notebook based uh, platform where uh, instead of you having to share notebooks locally and trying to figure out, you know, what type of in in infrastructure they were running on, um, you know, they manage all that for you. So you can kind of just share and collaborate uh, much more easy in your data science uh, community of practice. And so with that, I'm now going to go over to Zeppel, which uh, you can see here is a notebook that we have uh, stood up here. And I'm going to show you how Zeppel has incorporated Snowpark uh, Snowflake's new developer experience. So you can do feature engineering in your language of choice, as opposed to having to write complex SQL statements inside of Snowflake that are, you know, sometimes pretty, uh, pretty complex for even the average programmer. To get started, all you need to do is set your cell to Snowpark here. We have a bunch of just initialization functions to one, really just make our connection to Snowflake. And from here, we can start looking at some of the data sets that we're gonna be working with today. We've already taken a look here at our fraud detection table. We can see here the similar column as fraud, along with all the other data that we had um, in that table as well. Now, I do want to introduce the uh, Snowflake data marketplace as well. Uh, oftentimes, you don't have all the data that you need to get the most signal out of the problem you're trying to predict. For us, we have IP address as a potential column in our fraud data set. Today, I'm going to uh, use an IP geolocation data set to join to um, our main training set and see if we can enrich that data set with more additional information based on IP address. And thankfully, uh, thankfully for us, IP info was, was kind enough to let us use some of their third party data. And so IP info is a, a data set provider that re, uh, provides refreshed IP information um, at, at the current time. And so going back to Snowpark, for us, it's really simple just to click through uh, cells to run commands. And so here we're creating a session table and we can now uh, continue and see that we can perform some uh, feature engineering here, just written directly uh, within Scala as opposed to SQL. We can do our join on our, uh, our fraud data set with our IP info data set, and that'll be a left join. We can also add another column. And so this is where you, know, you can do some feature engineering to create additional columns based off of subject matter expertise that you might have. In this case, we're just gonna create an additional feature. Hey, they said their shipping address was inside the US, but their, their IP address was outside of the US. Let's create a new column, you know, IP in US, which will be a true or false column. And then from there, we can just write it to a new table called fraud detection with marketplace. And that'll be our training data set that we'll throw into data robot. Now, the cool thing to note, and if you're not uh, quite sold on Snowpark yet, the main thing it's going to do here is really act as a translation layer for you. And so in about five lines of code, we were able to join a data set, grab a, a third party data set and create a new column. If you wanted to do this by hand in SQL, you would have had to have written nearly uh, 30 lines of SQL nested um, with subqueries. And that can get pretty complicated for you to, for you to manage. 
Now going back to our worksheet here, we can go ahead and do a refresh. And we can see that we now have a new table that was generated from that Snowpark code with our original train data set plus our IP info um, data set joined on that IP column. So now we have region, country, the postal code of where that IP was, in addition to our new generated feature from us, IP in US. And so with that, I'll throw it back to Tony to get us started in Data Robot. Hey, thanks, Miles. So this is Data Robot. This is the landing page you're going to go to when you first open it up. And so one thing we can do is actually go to AI Catalog. And here we have two different data sets. So here we have a fraud detection data set, which is what we used to build a model earlier. And here we have our fraud data set with our additional marketplace data. And so I'm going to go ahead and click into that. And once we click in, we can see some information about it. So we can see the size of the data set. We can see we connected to it by a standard JDBC connector. We can also see the total number of features. And we also get a breakout. So we can see the total number um, of features by the different feature types. So here we have numeric, categorical, Boolean, as well as text in this data set. One other thing I want to show is that if we click in the profile, we can actually see sample data um, from the data set inside Snowflake. So in this case, we can see we have 27 columns. All right, now that the data has loaded, we can see this looks very similar to the data that was inside Snowflake. So we can see all the different fields it's in here, as well as the IP address that we joined on to the is fraud, which is going to be our target. And so with this, one of the things we can also do in AI Catalog is we can also version these data sets. But for now, let's go ahead and create this project and get modeling. All we have to do is click Create Project. So now Data Robot's going to pull this data set and get it loaded in. OK, now that our data set is loaded, um, we can see we have the fraud detection with Marketplace. We can enter our target up here, which is, is fraud. So we can see a distribution of it. One other thing that I'd like to point out down here is, is if we scroll down, we can actually see all the different features we have, as well as summary statistics for each one. And so if we look at total transaction amount, we can click into it. We can see the, the histogram, this specific feature. We can also show outliers. So as I click this, it's going to calculate the outliers present in this field. And while it's doing that, aside from the histogram, we can also see frequent values associated with this field. We can see a table representation of the different values. We can also transform this feature type. It's currently numeric. We could change it to a categorical. I'm going to leave that, and we'll go ahead and go back to the histogram. And we're going to go ahead and show the outliers. So here we can see we actually have some outliers that are pretty far out there. Um, a lot of the data is under about 1,200 for total transaction amount. We have some that go all the way up to 3,000. And we can see this for each one of the different features. But for now, um, I'm going to go ahead and scroll back up to the top. One feature I am going to change is the modeling mode. So it's currently set to quick. I'm going to go ahead and change that to autopilot, which is going to run a bit more comprehensive blueprints. And a blueprint is just a series of steps to go from raw data to prediction. Now we do have more advanced options we could set, but for now I'm going to go ahead and get going. I'm going to go ahead and hit start. But before I hit start, one of the things that's going to happen after I do is Data Robot's going to create the different partitions for cross-validation. And it's also going to analyze the features that are in there. And finally, it's going to generate the blueprints. So let's go ahead and hit Start. Minimize that. 
And while it's doing this, one of the things I'm gonna change is the number of modeling workers. So it's currently gonna run on two, which would mean it's gonna run two blueprints in parallel. I'm gonna up this so that we can, we can run more blueprints in parallel. So we'll go ahead and take it up to 20. Right now it's creating the different cross-validation and holdout partitions. So now it's gonna analyze the features and we're gonna see a new importance column pop up here to show the importance or the strength of each different of each feature to the target. And so again, we can click on some of these. So we can click on region. And here we can see all the different regions in the data set along with the percentage of fraud associated with each one. All right, so now that we have modeling processes going, I mean, see we're building 20 different blueprints in parallel. You can actually go ahead and jump over to the models tab. And here we have the leaderboard. And so this is where all we can see all the different blueprints that have been run. And so one of the things I want to point out is just the wide variety of algorithms that are being run. So we have everything from naive Bayes to deep learning terrace models, along with XGBoost and ElasticNet, and so on. So for the interest of time, I've already run this project. And so we can go ahead and jump over there and actually dive into one of these blueprints. So this is the project I ran just a little bit ago. You can see Data Robot has run 52 different blueprints for this. <clears throat> and so let's go ahead and dive into one of these. And so right away, you can see all the different steps that are taken. But if we click in, one of the things we'll be able to see is actually a visual representation of all these different steps. And so this is every step that happens in this blueprint to go from raw data all the way to prediction. And for each step, we have the ability to click into it and we can open up data robot model docs for it. Um, for this demo, let's actually jump over to the understand tab and let's look at feature impact. And so for the feature impact, we can see which features are most important to this individual model. And so in this case, CSR notes or the customer service representative notes are showing as the most important feature, followed by whether or not the email is on file and the country where the order was placed. And so this makes sense given what we've seen in our data set. But now <clears throat> for each individual prediction we get, sometimes it's helpful to see what the contributing factors are. And to do that, we can actually go to prediction explanations. And here we can see the top five reasons why a given prediction was assigned. So for this case, on the left-hand side here, we have a range from zero to one. So at the top is gonna to be the fraudulent transactions and down towards the bottom is gonna be the non-fraudulent. And so we can see for this prediction of 0 0.69, it's registering as more likely fraud. And so now we can see what the contributing factors are that are making it appear as fraud. So we can see the payment type is other, there's overnight shipping, um, there's no email on file, and the country is missing. The one factor that is contributing to this being less fraudulent is the email domain, and we can see that right here. And so actually, if we click into a transaction that's likely to be less fraudulent, we can see the explanation shift completely. So in this case, most of the features are showing that it's going to, are showing that it's contributing to being non-fraudulent, such as is night order, the email domain, as well as the payment type and the email on file. The one feature that's contributing most to this being possibly fraudulent is country. And that's because country is missing. So now that we've kind of evaluated the model, we've seen the feature impact, We've seen some of the prediction explanations. We want to um, actually look at one more thing. And so to do that, we're going to go to the Evaluate tab. And here it's going to land us on the lift chart. We have an ROC curve tab. 
which goes into more of the technical aspects of model evaluation. But one thing I like to look at is the profit curve. And so here on this tab, we can actually input um, some different numbers to see what the potential profit would be if we were to implement this model in production. And so I can easily do that by going, by entering the demo name and for the true negative. So this is, um, <clears throat> so these are transactions that the model predicted were not fraudulent that were not actually fraudulent. So in this case, we could enter 100. Now for the false positive, these are cases where the model predicted it was fraudulent, but it wasn't actually fraudulent. And so in cases like these, there's gonna be some intervention. And so there is a cost associated with that. And so right now we can go ahead and use 250. Now for a false negative, these are cases where the model said it wasn't fraudulent, but it was actually fraudulent. And so these are gonna have a higher associated cost. And so for cases like these, likely looking at about $1,000. Now the true positives, these are actually fraudulent transactions that the model predicted were actually fraudulent. And so for cases like these, um, given that we've seen the, um, the total transaction amounts, um, we've seen fraud, the fraud range anywhere from 500 down to about $2,000. So we can go ahead and use 1500 for this. And then we can go ahead and click save matrix. And so down here, we can see the total profit based on these input numbers, if we were to put this model in production would be about $278,000. And also with that, we can actually see data robot has adjusted the threshold for this, um, for this model to actually be 0 0.076 automatically for us. And so at this threshold, we're gonna maximize our profit given these input numbers. So now that we've seen this, we've seen the potential profit we can get from it. The next thing we wanna do is actually put this model into production to start driving value. And so to do that, um, we can actually go to the predict tab and then go to deploy. Now here you can see the prediction threshold is defaulted to 0 0.5. We can actually change that. And here you see our maximized profit demo um, that we just did. So if we select that, we can go ahead and click deploy model. And now up here we have our deployment name. So I'll go ahead and leave that as is fraud. Because we're gonna be deploying and scoring this directly in Snowflake, we need to change the prediction environment. And so to do that, all I need to do is select Snowflake and I'm going to leave um, data drift tracking in place. We'll enable prediction row storage, challenger models, and we'll track attributes. And so with all those set, I'm gonna go ahead and click create deployment. Um, I'll go ahead and leave this as a low importance. Click that. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Miles. Okay, thank you for that, Tony. So now that we've created a uh, is fraud predictions deployment inside of data robot with a snowflake uh, external prediction server endpoint. We're gonna walk through how you can take this model and start scoring all of your snowflake data inside of snowflake uh, without ever having to, you know, the data leave to some other, some other compute environment. And so now that we're at our deployment here is fraud predictions, we can click on the predictions tab and what this is going to do is one package up that model that we've chosen to deploy into a scoring code jar file. I can go ahead and click download and um, that'll bring that model to my local, local laptop here. And then for the purposes of this demo, um, I've already kind of copied and, and manipulated this code a little bit to, uh, to make it run here, but we give kind of all the code for you out of the box. So it's just a matter of copying and pasting to, to get this model up and running and scoring inside of Snowflake. And so I'll go ahead and keep my model here. And from here, we can now go back to our Snowflake worksheet. The first thing we need to do is bring that model that I've just downloaded back into a Snowflake stage. And so I can go over to my terminal where I have a, a sample SnowSQL context already set. 
I've already gone ahead and copied this path, which was uh, seen in our data robot page. I can go and go ahead and run this. And what this is going to do is again, you know, upload our data robot model into a Snowflake stage. From there, what we need to do is register this function inside of our Snowflake worksheet. And so this is already, again, pre-written for you. We can go ahead and execute it. And this is basically, basically just registering the function. And so when we go to call it, Snowflake knows exactly what it's looking for, knows the function to run, and then can give us an output. Now the last piece here, and we're going to create a table for this because we're going to score some of our data inside of our fraud detection scoring table, which is approximately 160,000 rows. One thing to note is we're using just an extra small warehouse here. If we go to 500,000 rows, 2 million rows, 10 million, and so on, you can leverage the scale out of the Snowflake warehouses and really reduce uh, that time to score um, given that scalable compute available to you. And so we'll go ahead and kick off the scoring job. And uh, the beauty here is we also give you exception handling if there's you know new values that are null. And so again, this is all just out of the box pre-written for you. We had a successful uh, table created with our scored data. We can go ahead and refresh our side terminal here and take a peek at the predictions that we've made. And you'll notice that took, you know, roughly only eight seconds to do. We can do a preview of the data. And now we can finally see that prediction on whether these transactions here were fraudulent or not. And of course, appended with the data that we, that we used to score it. And so transaction ID, city, shipping code, that kind of stuff alongside that third party marketplace data that we included as well. And so with that, I'll throw it back to Tony for one last time to look at data robots MLOps capability. Thank you. All right, thanks Miles. So now that we've scored the data inside Snowflake, um, we can actually go back to our deployments tab that we left earlier. If we scroll down just a little bit, you can actually see our is fraud predictions right here. And so if we click into this, here we're given the overview. So we can see the name, any description, we can see the environment that it's running in, as well as the importance level. You can also see information about the model. Um, next, we can look at service health. And so there's a lot of information here. Um, if we kind of start at the top, so we can see the model is current. So if we have any challengers deployed, we'll be able to see those here. Um, we can see the time range. We have the resolution at hourly. Um, <clears throat> and down here, we can actually see the total number of predictions already has been 20,000 over two requests. We can see the median response times and execution times, um, all done by one person. And so we can actually see the total predictions over time down here on the bottom. Now, one important thing when deploying a model is tracking the drift of the data over time. Because as, as time goes on, the data is likely going to change slightly from what the model was trained on. And there comes a point where you're going to want to retrain your model to account for that data drift. And so if we go to the data drift, um, on the bottom left here, we can see the actual drift tab. Um, <clears throat> and so on the bottom here, we can see the importance. And so this is the importance of each individual feature that's in the data set. And so zero is being less important. And the more towards one it is, the more important it is. And on the y-axis, we can see the drift. So this is how much the data has changed from the training data. And so as, um, as it goes higher up, the data, that feature has changed more than what it was trained on. So for instance, like IP in US, if we click that, we're actually taken over and we can see the feature details. So the dark blue is the training data that it was trained on. And we can see now that it's actually, the, the scoring data for that feature is actually drifting somewhat. Um, so we have missing, we also have a new level. We can click on any other feature in here.
to see the exact same thing. So for instance, if we want to look at postal and click on this, and we can see for the different postal codes, how the data has drifted. And we can see some of these have drifted more than others. Now, in this case, we didn't set up an association ID to track the accuracy over time yet. So in this case, I'm going to skip over the accuracy tab and we're going to look at challengers. And so a challenger model is another model that you can use to compare against the champion model. And the champion model is the one that's actually running in production that you're getting your predictions from. So in this case, we can see we have an XG boost model that's our champion. And we also have a light gradient boosted trees um, that is our challenger. So actually, if we scroll down, we can see they're both right here. So if we, we can uncheck and see individual ones as well. This is for class one. If we shift to class zero, we can actually see um, the predictions for that as well. So with that, I will turn it back over to Julian to close us out. Thank you, Tony. Uh, and thank you, Miles. Uh, it was really cool to see everywhere, everything is starting from getting that data, getting that extra set of information from the marketplace, using Snowpark to do the feature engineering in an easy way using Scala. And soon uh, we're going to support more languages, including Java and in the future Python. And then seeing all the capabilities that uh, Data Robot has in terms of building the models and then running the MLOps even though we've now pushed the model to do all the inference inside Snowflake. Um, so with that, uh, I know there's been uh, some questions that have been coming up on the chat. Uh, so the team is gonna hang around a little bit and answer a few of those. And after that, in a few minutes, we're just gonna uh, call it quits. And we hope that we can connect with everyone uh, after this demo. Thank you. Okay, and it's looking like we don't have any audience questions today. So with that, Dizon would like to thank the three of you for a great presentation. Dizon would also like to thank Snowflake for providing the audience with a great webinar. Lastly, thank you to everyone who attended today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career. Have a great day.